I think maybe this was ideally the album I thought I was making with Electric Circus, <laughs> where you know where you want to show a a, a a wide range of of styles, but not appear to be too you know over eager or enthusiastic with it like it just sounds natural and then you know by the third listen i realized that you're covering so much territory like you you go from you know some shit it goes completely hardcore to you know then you go afrofuturist and you do this 90s riot girls throwback thing and then like with uh 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 the last song before the throne like it's almost like if like you transport it back to an Alice Coltrane kind of oh. outtake. And the thing was like, I was hoping the song was going to be 17 minutes, like an Alice Coltrane song. And then it cuts <laughs> off. And I'm like, what the fuck? Uh, but um, that was one of my favorite ones on the album too. That's a hard oh, ass. That's a, that's a hard way to close the album. That yeah. It's, it's goddamn. Can you tell me just from soup to nuts, how you put it together? Cause in my mind, it's so every song is so unique. I think if making it in real time, I wouldn't know how you would see it as cohesive, but yet together it, it feels cohesive. Can can you just I'm, describe to us the process of that? I'm glad that it feels like one thing and it felt like one thing to me because it was all driven by this obsession and it was driven by this obsession with this building. I had been on a friend's board. It was like a, it was a Pinterest board that she had. She's called Jamala Johns and she's kind of a art curator. I think in the early days of Pinterest, it wasn't just like, this is a cute hairstyle, but some people were using it like a magazine, you know, so they were mm -hmm. they were using, they would put up a picture and then they would just write tons and tons. And she had this board called Artists and their uh, Creatives and their Workplaces. So she had Cara Walker arranging her silhouettes. She had a Picasso painting with light. And she had this photograph of this artist, this black artist, contemporary artist, this man. And he was sort of staring out of the frame with this, peaceful sort of bold expression and behind him was this weird contemporary art that I didn't understand you know a pile of bricks on the floor this mm -hmm. shaggy goat instead of legs it was had these spindles and it was going around on a circular track and then there was a big shop for a, a big sign for a shop Harold's chicken shop in Chicago was like a chef chasing after a chicken with a meat cleaver and Very he was familiar. just looking out like he was represented by white cube and he was looking out the frame like yeah, this is my art, you know. And I right. thought, who is this? I, I don't know contemporary art. Who is this man specifically? Who is this black man who's not working in figurative art, right? It's not paintings of people. It's not drawings of people. It's not photographs. It's this stuff. And I found out that he was called Theaster Gates. And then when I did some research, I found out that part of his practice is um, saving these buildings on the south side of Chicago. You know, he, he lives in the south side of Chicago. He's watched many buildings just get torn down by the city, you know. And Stony Island, <clears throat> where this building is, used to have big theatres, you know, really important theatres for black music. And just over the years, they've been torn down one by one. So, I mean, Chicago's architectural masterpieces. But then when you get to the south side, there's these holes, there's these gaps. And it's a kind of erasure of the history of the place and of the presence, the black presence in the place. And so... He saw this bank, it's a hundred year old bank, and it had been uh, slated for demolition for a long time. It's going to be pulled down by the city. The basement mm -hmm. was underwater, but it's this beautiful bank with these columns outside. You know, it's like a big square sort of Greco Roman building on Stony Island. And he decided he was going to save it. And so he bought it for $1 from the government and he saved $4 million by selling his own art to transform this bank. So it doesn't have art in anymore. It doesn't have any money in. Mm -hmm. He's saved it by filling it with art archives and historical archives. So it has 26,000 books that were given to the Johnson Publishing Company, submitted to the Johnson Publishing Company, who made Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine, the Egro Digest. Mm -hmm. So from 1943, you know, if you wrote a book in anything to do with black space, architecture, politics, dance, entertainment, recipe books, yearbooks, 
if you wrote PhDs and you wanted the Johnsons to review it and include it in their publication, you would send it to the to the Johnsons. So 26,000 of these books, you know, some of them we know and they're familiar, some of them super rare books. Mm -hmm. It's got those. It's got all of Frankie Knuckles' records in. So when Frankie Knuckles passed away, his entire record collection was given to the Stony Island Arts Bank. And it also has upstairs on the second floor these problematic objects from America's past, the mammy jars, the postcards depicting racial violence, newspaper articles since the 1800s, advertising copy, signage, objects for the home, ephemera, photographs that were collected by this black and Chinese banker called Ed Williams, who would go to these yard sales and flea markets and see these objects and think, you know, who wants who's collecting these things who wants to continue to have these things in the home so he would right. buy them to take them out of circulation and put them in boxes in his house and once he had amassed 40,000 of these objects his kids were like dad can we get it's kind of intense to be around this stuff can we get this out of the house <laughs> so he gave it he donated it to the rebuild foundation so the so the the arts bank is Contemporary art on the walls, it has exhibitions, then it's these historic objects, the Frankie Knuckles, it's all the slides from the University of Chicago, the glass slides from when people mm -hmm. give talks, so, you know, all, all of history that had been photographed for the University of Chicago, and then these 26,000 books. So when I saw the work that Theaster was doing, I thought, I want to get in that bank, I just want to be there, I just want to look around, I want to, and um, we managed to connect with him, I was on tour. He came to the show. He met up with me afterwards and I was just like, ah, I'm so excited to meet you because you're a visual artist, because you also have a band called the Black Monks of Mississippi, because you're a ceramicist, which I love ceramics, because he trained in Japan and because he's collecting these objects and because he's saving all these buildings in the south side of Chicago. So he has a social practice. I just, I was really excited to meet him. And I said, I really wish we'd come to the bank, but I'm leaving town at like 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. And he said, I'm also leaving town tomorrow because I'm going to President Obama's 50th birthday party. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is who this guy is. <laughs> so we opened the bank early for us and I went to it. And once I opened those doors, I just sort of blown away by the building, the size of the building, the library, the double height cube, the, mm -hmm. just the amount of stuff, you know, every single drawer you opened was like, songs from slavery times newspapers curling newspapers from 1840s print adverts from the 30s tins of beauty products you know just stuff and stuff and every corner and every just the arrangement of it and and theasta said oh you know you have to you have to do a show in here and and straight away i sort of flashed on the music that i had made to this point and felt like this is a new vessel nothing that i have made sort of fits in this space, it's a different kind of response that's needed. But then when I left, all I could think about was the things that I'd seen. You know, he, he had this sculpture in the corner and I said, oh, who did that? And he said, it's one of mine. And it looked like it had been made from wood that maybe had the paint stripped off. There was a certain amount of violence to it. And I said, oh, you know, where, what is it? And he said, it's a sculpture I made. It's from the floorboards from an abandoned police station in Chicago. And as soon as he said that, I immediately was thinking about the floorboards. What have the floorboards seen? You know, mm -hmm. so often in history, the objects are the witnesses to what has happened. They're the things that can't speak, but they're the things that see everything. The floor mm -hmm. in the police station, the telephone in the police station, the car, the rear view mirror. They are the things that really are holding the truth and so when I was on tour you know I, I mean my head was in the tour but at the same time I'd be lying in on my tour bus bed and I'd be just writing poems about things that I'd seen you know I wrote this poem called you who have walked these floors in fear I was thinking about this floorboard it was after the the death of Sandra Bland so I was thinking about you know who knows truth in some cases it's a person in some cases that person is unwilling to to uh, to express what has really happened in the situation but all the not all the physical objects they know and I just thought I want to get back to that bank I want to open more drawers I want to touch more stuff and every time I touched something I felt like it was 
it's old stuff, but it's fizzing with a kind of contemporary, mm -hmm. real life things happening in the molecules story. So really with the, with the writing of the record, you know, I, I went back for a two week residency. We stayed in the south side of Chicago. I mean, I'm from the UK, but you guys know Chicago. Chicago has its huge challenges, you know. Oh, we know. Yeah. So, so that was an eye opener. You know, we didn't have a car there, and we said, "Oh, we'll just, you know, we're staying so nearby. We'll just walk around." They're like, yeah. oh, no, "You can't walk around. You can't walk around." You know. So we walked to the place where we hide the car, and on a bus shelter, there was an advert for for what you could do if you wanted to, to needed to give up your child in the first thirty days of its life. You know, it was a list of things. It said. All you need to do is wrap it in a clean towel. Um, it has to be in the first 30 days of its life. You could take it to a fire um, fire station, fire station or you could yeah. drop it at this particular school mm -hmm. or that particular hospital. You can give information or you can have no questions asked. And it was particularly poignant that it was at a bush shelter because, of course, that's where so many children that couldn't be looked after have been left by parents that couldn't look after their children. So... Right. You know, just sort of walking, I thought, this is what this area, this is what this area is. And I thought about the importance of a building like this, which talks about the the his history of the area and just about the history of the people and how the situation is as it is now. And it hasn't always been the way it is and it won't always be the way it is, but how art is a place of it's a new space it's a physical space it's a place where people have the opportunity to imagine something different so i was there for two weeks i wrote some songs there i was i was home i was back and forth i mean this record was sort of seven years coming together you know so sometimes i was making music in the place we set up a studio in one of the buildings next to the bank and all the songs on the record are inspired by particular particular objects in the bank or groups of objects or events in the bank. And that to me was my sort of golden thread when I was making it. And then to me, whatever the style was, it, it didn't matter. It just, the, whatever the music was, it just kind of bounced off the object. So it's all about the objects and the, the tight remit was it, it has to be in response to these objects. And it just became my obsession. I felt like everywhere I looked, there was a, a story or a photo or something about Chicago, something about the South Side. So... Wow. What comes to you first? Do the words come first or does the music come first? Because there's some songs in which um uh like uh the he will follow me uh with his eyes in which yeah. like specifically melodically and your words are dependent on whatever chords being played. And it's not a circular song that it's looping. It's just kind of going linear into and it morphs into a whole another song by the end yeah. of it. So yeah. like are like what comes first for you like are the words hitting you first and then you find music to it or does the music come first i think in that situation in um and he will follow you with his eyes i had found this tin of a beauty product it was by this company called valmore and it was set up in chicago in 1926 and all the illustrations i found to be really beaut beautiful really elegant and they were done by this artist this black artist called charles dawson who became who was a very you know well known artist in his time, mm -hmm. and they were elegant and they were beautiful and there was also all this romance surrounding Valmore you know the copy of in the adverts so yes. if you saw an advert for Valmore it might say things like his eyes will follow you across the room <laughs> or, the, or the perfume it, the perfumes were called things like follow me boy or look me over everything everything had this romance and this glamour so I was kind of interested I was like what's this beauty you know, what's his company? And I found out that it was sold door to door, you know, so like Avon, they would knock on the door with this big basket of stuff. And I found that it was targeted mostly at, at black men and women. But of course, the era, I'm looking through the products, there's lots of perfumes, there's lots of moisturizers and shampoos and stuff, but there's a lot of hair straightening products, skin lightening mm -hmm. products, you know, white rose, cold cream, and, you know, work Ambie. straight away. The adverts are saying things like, don't you want to help yourself to love and happiness? You know, all of this is just away from you. If you don't just take, if you just take your skin a few shades lighter. That's why you're the rant at the end. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, because upon first initial, upon first listening, I was like, 
I was like, wow, this might be her best vocal performance because. And then the second time I was like, oh, maybe she's singing in a character. And then I realized by the end, I, I, I mean, I don't know if it's if it's more of an angry rant or more just a, a defiant thing about it. But I, I realized that that must be the story. I didn't know the history behind the song, but yeah. in the first I, I love the, the way song, that you sing in character in the beginning. Oh, and thanks. Yeah, I, want, yeah. I wanted to get into that sort of 50s space. And I was thinking about yeah. 50s medicated domestic femininity in america okay so it's like you've got all the things you meant to need you've got your vacuum cleaner and you've got your washing machine you've got your refrigerator refrigerator so as a woman you, your life is not difficult anymore you know you, you've got these appliances and you shouldn't complain and you're in the home and if things feel difficult there's always a tablet you can take from the doctors just to take the edge off things and then but then you know imagining someone coming to your door with these products there's a kind of femininity is already this narrow and then for black women it's it's even more narrow because the beauty is white aligned at this point you know so mm -hmm. you've got to do all the women stuff and then you've got to do the stuff to make your natural self augmented to be accepted and so in the first half of the song the person is definitely under the spell of right. Balmore I, I did that I wrote that song in the in the bank and I just played I played it on guitar you know, I, I sort of do my best on my guitar. Like, I'm not a trained guitarist, but I wanted to make it sort of, you know, 50s and dreamlike, like those kind of chords that would be mm -hmm. in, you know, those movies that start where the car's winding around the side of a mountain or whatever, yeah. an open-top car, and it's like there's the glamour. And, and then halfway through, I wanted to have this kind of sonic arresting. You yeah. know, so when I first wrote that, that was just like me playing one string, dum, 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 you know, <laughs> my plum red lipstick my black hair kinking my black skin gleaming you know i wanted it to be as you say sort of defiant you know i don't it says at the end i don't want to leave myself behind vanishing into a girl i don't recognize and i and when after you know because the record took me a long time so one time as a singer to vocal i was like i feel like i could bring more character into this you know i was thinking of like a as a kit, you know, with her incredible <laughs> diction and poise and the movement of the words and the everything so dramatic and elegant and controlled. Am, and I wanted to bring some in. Am, so in my excitement, um, I was making a, a, a quiet sleep playlist the day that the album came out. And so not even thinking about it, I just rushed that on the list. <laughs> The person went to sleep. Then you wake up. It was like, what the hell, Amir? And I was like, huh? And I was like, oh, I forgot <laughs> that sometimes codas and because you know, in my mind, when you're listening to it, I'm thinking like, okay, might have a new ID track, and that's the next song. I didn't realize it was the same song until that person told me, like, dog, you woke us up in the middle of the night, like. <laughs> Yeah. It was it wasn't that. It wasn't what you thought. Yeah, it's the worst record for DJs. But I always think my stuff's a bit like that anyway, sort of like it's bumpy, like you're just getting into one thing and then there's another thing. And I don't know, that's nah. my background. It's like I was a classically trained violinist and then I was in an indie band when I was fifteen. That was a music that I loved, you know. I had grown up with soul music, but indie was like my thing that I found, you know, Veruca Soul and L seven and Belly and and I liked I guess I liked you know, women in that music. I like seeing women play guitars and I don't know, they weren't shaving their armpits or they weren't having to wear a certain thing. They're just wearing t-shirts and their jeans and they're just right. doing their thing. And there was a lot of freedom in that. <laughs> 